Here are a few uh, examples of uh, things that I consider the uh, particular achievements of ours in, in our first uh, decade. Uh, putting together the process to do a 3,000 patient study uh, and overseeing that well is actually a very big undertaking. Uh, and so I'm very proud of the quality of the studies we have uh, established. Uh, but particularly so because the products were used were ones which there was also not an existing FDA regulatory process to assure that the products were, were well characterized and consistent. And NCAM has led the way in establishing those criteria. And um, there are now uh, a set of criteria called consort criteria for herbal products that set publication standards for how well characterized a product should be uh, before uh, papers on it are published. There are many papers published that, that study a botanical but don't tell you where it came from, don't even give you the Latin name of the plant, uh, and uh, don't meet uh, appropriate scientific standards. We've made important contributions to safety issues. Oops, I keep going the wrong way here. Um, and I wanted to tell you about this paper. This is a very nice study that was done uh, by a, um, a K awardee, a career awardee, uh, who was at that point uh, in um, just a, a beginning investigator, Bob Saper at Harvard. And what he did in this study was he did an internet search for Ayur sites where you could purchase Ayurvedic medications. And he found uh, that there were approximately 600 uh, uh, medications for sale, took a random sample of those, and purchased and obtained 278. Uh, then he arranged with colleagues to uh, test all of those uh, substances for lead, mercury, and arsenic. Oops. Um, and this is the summary of his results as far as lead is concerned. What you see there with the three blue lines are three different regulatory standards. P -p Plotted on the uh, uh, x-axis is the estimated daily lead ingestion if you took the product as, it was to as you were told to take it on the, uh, on the label. And uh, approximately 20% of the substances he tested exceeded one or other of the regulatory standards. Um, and uh, this is a, a very liberal regulatory standard, but even this uh, most widely accepted regulatory standard was exceeded by uh, many of these products. Black are products uh, purchased in the US, or red are pro products purchased in India. Well, I think this is a very familiar with lead poisoning because it, it's bad for your kidneys and uh, I think this is a, a substantial concern, especially if individuals took this for a long time. The FDA thought so too. And uh, they issued uh, this advisory after that. And one of the things that I think it might interest you to, to hear is that the NIH is not in charge of regulation of safety issues. Uh, the FDA is. And we have to uh, develop processes where we see the science that then contributes to the regulatory decisions. Uh, and so that's where we see our role. We can't take on monitoring the country's dietary supplements. But we can also be very happy when a concern comes out of the science that then leads to uh, regulatory uh, decisions. Um, and these are just some of the areas that I think of as pretty interesting right now where we have uh, some research going on or are eager to see more research going on. There are a lot of nice and interesting small molecules in foods we eat um, that clearly affect biology, but we don't yet really understand what they do. Uh, if you're on a healthy, high fruit diet, you are eating a fair amount of quercetin. You'll have measurable levels circulating of quercetin, a lot of quercetin in apples and plums. Uh, quercetin in cell cultures has some interesting effects. It's really worth knowing 
what does a compound like that, that's in so much of our food, uh, has no known toxicity that we know yet, uh, what's it actually do? Another one that's very interesting and very variable in the intake is curcumin. Curcumin is an compo important c component of uh, turmeric and uh, cumin and a number of seasonings used widely in certain cuisines, although not in the typical Northern European cuisine. Uh, but curcumin seems to have some very strong anti-inflammatory effects. And there are a bunch of other polyphenols and flavonoids that also uh, may help us understand this persistent correlation between the fruit and vegetable diet and, and health. CoQ10 uh, is a dietary supplement uh, that's pretty widely used. And co CoQ10 levels fall when you're on statins. And there's at least a very plausible biological argument that CoQ10 uh, might uh, be p a good prophylactic for the muscle aches that people get who take statins. Uh, the studies that have looked at that, uh, CoQ10, uh, myopathy in, with statins is also associated with acute renal failure, um, but that's a very rare event. So this has been uh, the actual muscle breakdown. So this has been very hard to study. The two studies that have tried to examine this um, really didn't have enough cases to, uh, to get a definitive answer. Even uh, release of CPK from muscle is, is not all that common with statins. So this is an interesting idea, uh, but one that would take a pretty large study to get a clear answer for. Um, a fair amount of work going on on potential anti-inflammatory actions of omega-3s. Uh, one of the big problems in, in omega-3 literature and omega-3 re research is it's a very huge variation in how much people eat. And so you, the, the interventions may take place on top of a background noise that's as large as the intervention. Same problem comes up with soy. Um, we have about four groups uh, working on the potential of cranberry juice to uh, affect uh, urinary tract infections. And this is a nice prophylactic mechanism if it works, be, uh, partly because urinary tract infections are of substantial concern in pregnancy when we really want to uh, avoid drugs and cranberry juice might be, but I don't know, uh, an interesting answer. Um, the, the other area that's uh, very interesting right now are the issues of uh, uh, pre and probiotics. I'm sure some of you have heard some of the interest in, in the microflora that live in our, uh, our guts. And um, there's some reason to think that certainly in newborns that the administration of probiotics uh, w may influence the uh, colonization of the gut. Uh, probiotics are considered by Cochrane and other systematic reviews to be useful in the prophylaxis of necrotizing enterocolitis in newborns. And um, so this is uh, particularly in premature babies. Um, and this is an area that we're um, expecting to, to do, see some more work on. And another area that's very interesting, nothing yet clear cut, but uh, there are many interesting active components in traditional Chinese herbal remedies. So the other half of what we do has to do with things that affect the mind and the body and these uh, CAM practices. And here I think we've also uh, had a number of achievements so far. Uh, the methodology for studying things like meditation, acupuncture, and mind-body interventions. It, these are difficult problems, but we're seeing uh, progress and greater number of rigorous studies, including studies on the neuroscience of and, and brain imaging on what happens to your brain with either meditation or acupuncture. Um, and we also think that having uh, uh, funding for this kind of research is bringing more attention to uh, psychosocial support, which is one of the things that uh, is a recurrent theme in uh, people's search for alternative health practices. And we're very interested in uh, seeing more science being brought to what happens between practitioners and patients uh, and uh, in how to help all of us 
uh, learn what are the helpful ways to, to get people to lead healthier lives. Here's an example of some research that is like that. This is a paper published by uh, John Tilbert uh, based on a survey of uh, placebo treatments. Uh, and he did a, a survey of general uh, uh, family practice docs and uh, yeah, wrong internists and rheumatologists and, and asked them about a series of questions about whether they used placebos. Very sizable number did, uh, maybe around about half. A and uh, this uh, caused a very intense uh, uh, debate in the medical literature. There were half a dozen letters to the New York Times about this. Uh, some people thought it was terrible. Some people thought that all docs did this and maybe even should. Uh, and, um, but I think that the debate uh, is an excellent thing because it's a tough problem as everyone who takes care of patients knows. Here are a few things that we see very promising. Uh, yoga and Tai Chi uh, look very useful for balance and avoiding falls in the elderly. Uh, the mind-body interventions, as I mentioned, are getting it's showing interesting neuroscience. And uh, meditation, acupuncture, other mind-body practices uh, look like they can really help with a variety of kinds of symptom management, but most especially pain. So one theme in the way I'm thinking about all this is that symptoms really matter. And some of the benefits that people uh, find in alternative practices uh, have to do with symptom management. And uh, that we should learn from that, figure out how, where that uh, is most effective, and, and learn uh, for all parts of the health systems uh, to, to utilize that when it really will help. That is to say that we're after building up evidence, and NCAM's about evidence, as is the rest of the NIH. Uh, I see this, this isn't a, a, a pyramid I, I developed, you'll see it in a variety of forms in, in lots of places, but the uh, basic biological understanding is the underpinning of everything we do, uh, but that should lead to rigorous human studies, particularly double-blind trials when appropriate, and, and those then are subject to systematic reviews and guidelines. In the area of back pain, um, I think this is really happening right now for complementary and alternative medicine. So these three uh, recently published studies are, are examples. The lowest is a, a very careful study uh, led by Karen Sherman on uh, yoga uh, for chronic low back pain, uh, a randomized control trial with a careful attention to attention, time and attention um, matching. The middle is a systematic review on uh, what um, certain kinds of exercise do for people with chronic low back pain. And the top is a recent guideline from the American College of Physicians and the American Pain Society. And, and one of the recommendations in this uh, guideline is that uh, one thing to consider in people with uh, uh, low back pain of more than six weeks duration is that uh, chiropractic massage or, or acupuncture may be uh, useful adjuncts to care. So we, we support research that covers these whole areas all these areas, uh, we, it isn't really a pipeline in the way uh, much of modern science is with uh, findings going from basic science all the way to real world application, because a lot of these practices are already in the real world. Uh, I, I told you a little bit about some of the major blue circle trials, large RCTs that, that NCAM has uh, funded. An area that we're really trying very much to strengthen that we think is very important is knowing more about how these practices are used in the real world, how people decide uh, what the real uh, safety and efficacy uh, issues look like. And, and so this is an area we're very much uh, trying to strengthen. We're, we're also realizing that herbal trials, uh, very much like pharmaceutical trials, need to be based on a good answer to the yellow circle, to the how does it work. With retrospection, I think both the Echinacea and St. John's Wort trials uh, would have been stronger if there had been uh, clearer ideas about a likely mechanism. Uh, we just completed an, a symposium summarizing all of this. 